Good morning. Last time we discussed uh, how the pointing theorem and the skin effect that we had uh, been talking about for the last few weeks has uh, can be applied to circuits. So I took three cases. One, I looked at current flowing through a sheet, a two-dimensional wire, and looked at uh, how the current actually flows. And what we found was that the current flowed primarily at the walls. This curve being cos of, if this distance is A by 2, um, x over delta with some basic I naught. So it is basically an exponential provided A over 2 is much greater than delta. If A over 2 is not much greater than delta, it has a more complicated shape which is given by the cos hyperbolic. What this means is the following. The amount of power that is sent through this portion of the wire which is 1 delta wide has to do with I squared R. And if the current basically is proportional to e to the minus x over delta, which is what it is, cos is this divided by 2 for large arguments. That is to say cos of u is equal to e to the u plus e to the minus u over 2. So if u is large, it becomes e to the u over 2. So if I substitute that x is much larger than delta, I can replace the cos, sorry, e to the x over delta divided by 2. Now of course there is an I naught there. This I naught is given by the total current is equal to integral minus A by 2 to A by 2 of I naught cos x over delta dx. That is, <coughs> there is current everywhere. The, that the current in here with the width dx is I naught cos x over delta dx. So if I integrate from the left boundary to the right boundary, I get the total current. Now integral of cos is nothing but sin hyperbolic. So it becomes delta I naught sin hyperbolic of x over delta between A over 2 and minus A over 2. And if you look at sine hyperbolic, sine hyperbolic is an odd function. It is a function like this. So at A over 2, it is large and positive. At minus A over 2, it is large and negative. So if I subtract a large and negative number from a large and positive number, I get twice the large and positive number. So it becomes twice delta I naught sine hyperbolic of A over delta. Once again, sin u can be approximated. Sin hyperbolic of u is equal to e to the u minus e to the minus u over 2, which is approximately equal to e to the u over 2. So if I want to know what the current is at the edge, what I have, the current as a function of x is equal to I naught cos hyperbolic of x over delta. I can substitute for cos and I can substitute for I naught from here. So I get it is equal to e to the power of x over delta divided by 2, that is from here, divided by 
this i naught is given by taking all of these to the denominator there. So, i divided by twice delta times sin hyperbolic of a over 2 delta, which is again e to the x over delta divided by 2. A over delta. So, you can see that there is an exponential variation of the current, but this current is always going to be smaller than e to the power of a over 2 delta. Let me take that exponential to the numerator. So, what do I get? This 2 cancels with this 2. So, I get that the current is equal to i over 2 delta times the exponential of x over delta times exponential of minus a over 2 delta. What I have done is I have taken this a over 2 delta to the numerator where it became exponential of minus a over 2 delta. This factor of 2 cancels. So, I get i over 2 delta times this. Now, I can combine exponents and therefore, I get my answer that i of x in a wire is equal to the total current in the wire divided by 2 delta times e to the minus a over 2 minus x divided by delta. So, it is an exponentially falling function. It falls to 1 over the e of its value over a distance delta and the current density at the surface is given by the surface current density is given by i over 2 delta. Now, usually if you look at any of these treatments, you will see i over delta as a surface density. The reason why we have i over 2 delta is because the current not only flows in this surface, it flows on this surface. Since there are two surfaces on which it flows, the amount of current flowing through this surface is i over 2. So, that current divided by delta is the current density. So, there is a very high current density even though the current may not be very high, the current density is very high. Now, if you look at how much of the current is flowing through which part, that comes from taking an integral over different parts of this wire, but we know about exponentials. So, if you have exponential e to the minus x, and you plot it versus x, you know that over a distance 0 to 1, the amount of the exponential is more or less 67 percent of the total value. In fact, if you take the area of this rectangle, it is equal to the integral of e to the x all the way to infinity, and so you can easily see the piece that we have left out is smaller than the piece we have taken. So, more than half of the current is in this first delta region. If you take 2 delta, that becomes even more. Now, if you ask of how much energy dissipation is happening, then that comes to i squared r. And when you look at i squared r, all the energy dissipation pretty much is happening here, because i squared goes as e to the minus twice this. And if you look at the e to the 2 x, the curve would, would look like this. There would, all, there would be almost nothing left beyond the, beyond the skin depth. So, the, as far as power goes, 
almost all the power loss is in first skin depth. This is why skin depth is such an important concept. The current is there, the power dissipation is there and therefore we really need to understand the skin depth and how it applies to our problems very carefully. And as we saw two lectures ago, the skin depth in different materials depends on its frequency because delta is equal to 1 over square root of pi f mu sigma. So, it depends on f. So, the larger the frequency, the smaller the skin depth. For copper at 60 hertz or 50 hertz, the skin depth is less than 1 centimeter, which is why in power cables you have the ability to avoid putting unnecessary copper in the middle of the wire. So, you have seen this, I have drawn it two lectures ago and I am sure you have seen it in your uh, uh, power lectures. By packing copper cables around a st central strength member and having current carried through these, the result is the full copper is used for current conduction. The central strength member gives you, gives the cable the ability to avoid being distorted and uh, snapped. Had we taken a single copper cable of the same total gauge, then what would have happened is that the central portion of this copper would not really have carried any current, only the outside would have carried current and we would have wasted this copper. As it is, by, by putting all this copper around another member, we are in fact saving on copper cost. It is a clear cut case of skin depth in use. Okay, I want to do two things now in this lecture and the first is I want to take the pointing theorem that I have been talking about and make it more useful. Let me remind you what we had derived. We derived that surface integral E cross H dot ds, which is the radiation flux out of a surface, is equal to minus the volume integral of energy sources of that flux, which is J dot E plus H dot del B del T plus E dot del D del T. Now, this is conceptually very satisfying, but it is very general also. It is meant for arbitrary fields E and H, but in electrical engineering, regardless of the field, whether it is power or it is uh, power systems or its communication, we are always dealing with phases el of electrical and magnetic fields. So, we would like to translate this pointing theorem to a phasor equation. By that I mean, I would like to rep represent the electric field, which is a function of position and time. I would like to replace it with a phasor which is a function of position times e to the j omega t. Now, just as last time we are having a confusion between j and square root of minus 1, so I am going to call this capital J, but typically current density is represented as small j, but to avoid the confusion I am calling it capital J. So, your electric field is a phasor multiplied by e to the j omega t. 
your magnetic field is also a phasor again function of position e to the j omega t. Similarly d, similarly b and similarly j. So, all of these are now represented as phases. Now, what you know that means is that really we take the real part of these expressions. And knowing that this is how we are going to represent, we want the equation not for E, H and J, but for the phases E, H and J. Now, if you look at this left hand side, I am talking about E cross H. So, E cross H would really be real part of the phasor E, E to the j omega t cross real part of phasor H, E to the j omega t. Now, if I want to make this useful, I would like to say that this is equal to real part of E phasor cross H phasor. Otherwise, this representation is of no use to me. But if I do, if I combine these two expressions, I do not get this because I have e to the j omega t times e to the j omega t. So, e to the 2 j omega t appears. Since I want it in without the e to the j omega t, I take the complex conjugate of the second term. If I take the complex conjugate of the second term, then clearly this will become complex conjugate minus j omega t. So, e to the j omega t will cancel out and I will have this quantity. Now, I do not know what use it is, but at least it does not have the phasor exponential. So, I am going to try and work out what is the pointing theorem when you apply it to the phasor E cross H star. It may seem rather uh, artificial what we are doing, but it is actually very useful. So, let me write out Faraday's law and Ampere's law. Curl of the phasor E is equal to minus del B del T, but now del del T is J omega. So, minus j omega phasor b. Curl of phasor h is equal to the phasor j plus j omega the phasor b. So, I have these two equations and to compare with them, let me write down the original equations which were curl of E is equal to minus del B del T and curl of H was equal to J plus del D del T. So, the del del T's have become J omegas. Now, as before, I want to work with E cross H, but you can see that I want to work with E cross H star. So, let me write the complex conjugate of that equation curl of H star is equal to J star plus complex conjugate of J omega D. The complex conjugate will become the complex conjugate of each of these multiplied together. So, minus J omega just in case you did not understand that, let us say this is D, this is the real, this is the imaginary axis. When I multiply by j omega, effectively I am rotating by 90 degrees. Now, 
the reason is real part multiplied by j becomes imaginary part, imaginary part multiplied by j becomes minus real part. So, the entire vector rotates by 90 degrees and of course, is scaled by omega. Now, I want to take the complex conjugate which means the real part is unchanged, imaginary part goes down. Now, how can I do that? Well, if I, I want to reach this vector because if j omega d is pointing this way, I should leave the real part unchanged, I should make the imaginary part negative. So, what I do is I say this vector is equal to the complex conjugate of d, this is d star and j omega is pointing this way, then this way would be j omega complex conjugate because again imaginary part is changed in sign. The product of these two will be a rotation by minus 90 degrees which brings me here. So, j omega d complex conjugate is equal to j omega complex conjugate d complex conjugate and j omega complex conjugate is nothing but minus j omega times complex conjugate of d. So, that is what I have written there. So, I have the two equations I want and I now want to work with e cross h. As before, I want to look at divergence of e cross h star and it is equal to del del x i of epsilon i j k e twiddle j h twiddle star k, where I have used the epsilon i j k notation to represent cross product. I can pull this out and write this as epsilon i j k del e j del x i h k plus e j del h k del x i. Product rule, when I take a derivative of a product, I take the derivative of each in turn. So, now I just identify these as suitable curl operations. So, the first one is I rotate once, so it is equal to epsilon k i j del e j del x i. This is nothing but curl of e times h star. The second term I want i and k, so I want j as the first index epsilon j k i del h k conjugate del x i e j. If I look at this, you can see that this h is the second index and not the third index, so it is equal to minus curl of h twiddle star. I am going through this quickly because exactly the same thing was done for pointing theorem. Given that we have done got this far, the rest is easy. So, my curl of e cross h star sorry divergence of e cross h star is equal to two terms. The first term is the conjugate of h dot the curl of e that is this term plus sorry minus e dot the curl of h conjugate.
but now I can apply Faraday's theorem and Ampere's theorem, Ampere's law. So I can apply this equation and I can apply this equation. So what I get is complex conjugate of H dot minus J omega B twiddle minus E dot the cross product, I mean the curl of H is given by this expression. So J complex conjugate minus J omega D complex conjugate. So I have an expression for the divergence. So I can apply the divergence theorem and I get surface integral phasor E cross phasor H conjugate dot ds is equal to, I can see a minus sign everywhere. So I will take the minus sign out, volume integral E dot J conjugate that takes care of this term plus J omega H conjugate dot B and since I pulled out a minus sign, I have to keep this minus sign minus J omega E dot D conjugate. Now we can apply our knowledge that J is equal to sigma E B equals mu H and D equals epsilon E. So if you put those in, you get that this is equal to minus volume integral sigma E squared because E dot E conjugate, this would be conjugate. So E dot E conjugate, so sigma E squared. So actually this should be sigma star, come back to that. Then plus J omega times H squared with a mu minus E squared epsilon. So this is the new equation we have. The phasor E cross H with H conjugated is equal to minus of volume integral of sigma E squared plus J omega mu H squared or if you like J omega B squared over mu minus j omega epsilon e squared. Now you can look at this and I will remove this uh, complex conjugate. We will assume that sigma and uh, epsilon and mu are real quantities. This is pure real. And this is also pure real. So sigma E squared is pure real because whatever E may be, E may be a complex number but magnitude of E squared is a real number. Similarly magnitude of H squared is a real number, magnitude of E squared is a real number. So this quantity is real. So inside this integral is a real number plus J omega times another real number. So this is the real part, this is the imaginary part is equal to this E cross H. So we can say the real part of this surface integral is equal to the real part of this volume integral. The imaginary part of the surface integral is equal to the imaginary part of this volume integral. Now where does that lead us? 
you can look here and this is the time uh, non-phasor version of Poynting theorem and I am going to write out the phasor version underneath it. The phasor version is actually two equations. It says real part of phasor E cross phasor H star dot ds is equal to minus the volume integral sigma E square dv and imaginary part of E cross H is a star dot ds is equal to again minus sign j omega, so the j goes off because it is imaginary part, volume integral mu h squared minus epsilon e square dv. It does not look anything like these equations. You have got two equations instead of one and there is quite a bit of difference between these equations and this equation. Let us see if we can understand what they are saying and why they are saying the same thing. If I look at the time dependence of the phasor, in time there is an e to the j omega t. So, the real part of phasor E is going to be like a sinusoid because it is going to be cos omega t. Now, if you take cos omega t and take absolute value squared because you want epsilon E squared, you look at this piece that piece is saying volume integral epsilon e squared over 2. Now, this epsilon e squared over 2 is really volume integral epsilon cos omega t squared times this magnitude of the phasor square. If we now average this cos omega t squared over time, this average is half because if you take the square of this number, you get an expression that looks like this and as you have seen before, the average of this expression is half because this piece exactly fits here. So, there are equal bits above half and equal bit below half. So, the average is half. So, this becomes epsilon mod E squared over 4. What we have here is epsilon E squared and then we have an omega that stands for the DDT. So, we can put this 4 inside, we can put this 4 inside and pull the 4 out. Then this part represent, represents stored electric energy and this part represents stored magnetic energy. Now, what about this piece? Well, this piece, if you look at this function, we know that j dot e is really sigma e square, but e is cos omega t. So, we know that e square is really 
this phasor amplitude squared, but averaged in time gives you a factor of 2. So, this quantity I will divide by 2 and multiply by 2. This piece volume integral of sigma E phasor squared over 2 is energy dissipated. So, now let us try and read this new phasor equation. The original equation said that whatever energy is leaving a surface through radiation is because there is a battery inside, so negative j dot e or there is reduction in stored magnetic energy or there is reduction in stored electric energy those were the things that could give me outward radiation. Now, when, you, when I have a phasor, it means that the time dependence is cos omega t. So, the on average the stored magnetic energy and the stored electric energy cannot change because after a period 2 pi over omega, it will come back to its old value. So, the stored magnetic energy and the stored electric energy are just cycling they are going to a maximum, going back to 0, going to a negative maximum, going back to 0. So, these two quantities do not change on average. However, this can. The real part of the phasor pointing theorem is only talking about the part that survives averaging in time. And it says that the real part of E cross H is equal to twice minus twice the dissipated energy. What about the imaginary part? The imaginary part does not care about the dissipated energy at all. It only looks at the electric and magnetic energies. And what it is saying is that since the energy in the magnetic and electric fields are periodic, there can only be one thing that is happening half the cycle energy is in the magnetic field, the remaining half of the cycle the energy is in the electric field. So, the electric field and the magnetic field are exchanging energies and that is what this represents. The imaginary part represents the fact that energy is shifting back and forth between electric and magnetic fields. The rate at which they are shifting comes is important because we are talking about del del t and there is a factor of 4 because of the way that we are not talking about DC fields, we are talking about AC fields. So, the imaginary part is what is called reactive energy and it is talking about the fact that there is rearrangement of energy inside the volume and this rearrangement shows, shows up as a fluctuating E cross B at the surface. There is no net av time averaged energy going out energy goes out for half the cycle comes back in. So, if, if you looked at a pictorial uh, representation of this phasor equation, it will be like this. I have a surface, inside the surface I have fields, currents. These currents for example, could be dissipating energy in which case I would have energy coming into the system from all directions. So, this time independent or at least time averageable term in the uh, E cross H is the real part is equal to minus twice j dot e averaged, averaged in time and also of course, volume integrated. So, the real part is referring to dissipation or generation of energy. What is the imaginary part rep representing? For example, supposing I had
a circuit where a capacitor and an inductor are exchanging energy. And let us say this is not a very well insulated system, so the flux lines, both the electric flux lines and the magnetic flux lines are leaking. In that case, there will be electric fields due to the capacitor which will be oscillating in time and there will be magnetic fields fluctuating at the surface because of the inductor. These fluctuating electric and magnetic fields, half the cycle will give me an E cross B out, but the remaining half of the cycle they will be giving me an E cross B in. Of course, they will be in general direction, so they might be giving a E cross B out this way and this way, but whatever it is, it does not lead to a time averaged E cross H. So, if I time average this equation and require that B and H are B and E are sinusoidal periodic functions, I, they will just vanish because they will not survive time averaging, only this term would survive. But within each period, the amount by which E cross H differs from its time average will be basically due to these terms and that is what you see here. The imaginary part of E cross H star is equal to minus 4 omega multiplied by average stored magnetic energy minus average stored electric energy. And all these averages are in time. So, the phase of form of the pointing theorem tells us a great deal and therefore, it is quite important to use, use it in your problem because it is really giving you the information that you specifically want. This equation is fully correct, there is nothing wrong with it. It contains everything and it contains much more than these equations because it is valid even if the fields are not phasor. It is valid for a field that is slowly growing from 0. But these are the useful expressions for most of electrical engineering and that is why it is important to know them. Before I leave this topic, let me just go back and revisit stored electric and stored magnetic energy. If you look at the phasor expression, either of these, what you see, let us go back here because we will need to use this form for this derivation. What you see is that you have terms which involve J dot E, terms which involve del del T of B squared over 2 mu and del del T of E squared times epsilon over 2. Now, before I go there, let me just point out one important point. When we did this derivation in phasors, you will notice we did not get a factor of 2. The moment we work on this, we find that we get del del T of B squared over 2 mu, but there is no factor of 2 coming out of the phasor form. The reason is that the factor of 2 came because we tried to push the electric field into the time derivative and the magnetic field into the time derivative. We were using the fact that if you have any vector v dot del v del t, then this is equal to del del t of v squared over 2. However, in when you work with phasors, the derivative has become a multiplication and it is no longer true that a factor of 2 is required. 
but the factor of 2 is still there and that is why we have taken it into account by putting a 1 over 4 here, 1 over 2 because of cos squared and 1 over 2 because really the factor of 2 is there for stored energy and that is why we came to a 4 omega factor in these expressions. Okay. Now, let us look at this, this expression and let us try and understand where stored magnetic energy came from. We have already done the derivation before, but I would like to show it as a trivial consequence of pointing theorem. I am going to say I am looking at Faraday's law. My Ampere's theorem is just curl of H is equal to J. So, I do not have radiation. Radiation was not yet happened before Maxwell. So, my pointing theorem says 0 is equal to minus volume integral j dot e plus h dot del b del t plus e dot del d del t dv. Now, I can choose supposing I want to know I have some currents J and I want to know what is the stored magnetic field energy that threads this J. So, I can carefully introduce the J such that divergence J always remains 0. If divergence J remains 0, then del rho del T is 0, which means rho is 0. The electric field does not have any source. So, I can drop this term. There is no electric field. What does that give me? It tells me that whatever amount of energy that is coming through J dot E must be coming out of minus h dot d b d t that is j dot e is equal to minus h dot del b del t. If I assume b is mu h that is saying minus del del t of b squared over 2 mu. This is the energy dissipated, this is the expression in terms of the magnetic field. So, I can write integral 0 to t of minus j dot e d t is equal to b squared over 2 mu final minus b squared over 2 mu initial. So, that is saying that the amount by which the magnetic field energy increased is nothing but j dot e, which is the energy I put in. So, it is a confirmation that this expression for magnetic field energy is correct. Pointing theorem essentially includes all the earlier work we have done automatically includes stored magnetic energy, stored electric energy, energy dissipation and energy in the form of a battery and all of circuit theory is here and therefore, naturally stored magnetic energy is one of the things that is there. The last topic that I want to take up in waves is the problem of boundary conditions. We have already looked at two such cases. One is perfect conductor and we found that 
the wave arrived at the perfect conductor and reflected. No energy went into the perfect conductor. We also looked at the case of poor conductor. And we assumed that the conductor was had the same epsilon and mu as the other side. And there we said there is no reflected wave, it is all transmitted. In which case we found we had the skin effect, energy decayed over a distance delta, and the wave propagates into the material. Now, I would like to generalize this. I would like to talk about a general material and ask where what is happening in it. First of all, let us look at a dielectric. So, I have a material with let us say mu equals mu naught epsilon equals some epsilon naught epsilon r and there is a small sigma. This is typical for example, if you have a capacitor plate with dielectric in the middle. There will be a very small leakage current, it will be so small it may take the capacitor a day to discharge, but there is going to be a small amount of leakage current, which means sigma is not 0, it is small. Now, what is the wave equation in this system? Well, it is curl of curl of E is equal to curl of minus del V del T minus mu del del T of curl of H, which is minus mu del J del T minus mu epsilon del square D del T square. On the left hand side, this becomes minus del square E. We have derived this many times now, so there is no need to spend time on the equation. Now, I am going to immediately assume phasors. So, I am going to assume that my electric field is E naught E to the j omega t. Furthermore, since I am interested in looking at plane waves, I am going to assume it is e to the minus j k z. So, I have the material, this is z and the plane wave is propagating in z. So, the electric field is in the x direction, magnetic field is in the y direction. Since it looks like e to the minus j k z, what it really means is it is like cosine. So, after a distance z, it goes to constant, then it is pointing downwards, then it goes back to constant, then it goes back to pointing upwards. So, the electric field is a, sin is a sinusoidal function of z, it is also a sinusoidal function of t. So, it has the same form e to the j omega t minus k z is the same form as f of z minus c t. So, this is where we started from some lectures ago, we are still there. So, if I substitute all that in here, I get k squared e e x is equal to minus j omega mu sigma e x plus omega squared mu epsilon E x.
now mu is mu naught but epsilon is epsilon naught epsilon r and I have this additional term earlier on we looked at this term and said this is dominating this term but now I am looking at a dielectric in a dielectric sigma is very small so I cannot assume that this term dominates omega squared mu epsilon in fact it is the other way around omega squared mu epsilon dominates minus j omega mu sigma so what I am going to do is I am going to combine these two terms if I combine these two terms I get omega squared mu epsilon times 1 minus j omega mu sigma divided by omega squared mu epsilon I can now take this piece as a complex correction to my epsilon and if I do that and I treat a dielectric as a system which has some real and some imaginary part to its uh, dielectric constant you find that all of plane wave theory that we have already derived applies to a dielectric I will complete the derivation next time and we will see how it works out.